Good morning to you all. Uh, good to be able to come to you by way of video and to proclaim the blessed Word of God. We are excited about uh, being able to preach the Word of God to you in your homes as we are uh, facing this winter storm. Uh, no doubt uh, the roads are going to be slick. They already are, and uh, there's more to come. And so we've decided to try to stay in. And uh, I'm recording this to put it in the group uh, that you can feast on the Word of God today. So if you have a copy of God's Word in front of you, be turning to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter number one. We have been emphasizing here in the book of Galatians that the book of Galatians is the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, is the Christian's declaration of independence that God has given. And uh, Sunday before last, when we started our series here in the book of Galatians, we spent time talking about the authority of Paul, him validating his ministry, and so forth and so on, and that his apostleship and and now we're getting to the source of his message here in the book of Galatians chapter number one. And he emphasizes much on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, last week, I mean week before last, we looked at the sovereignty of the gospel. Today, uh, I want to deal with the sacredness of the gospel. Let's read in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bow in your presence, thanking you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the ability to come through uh, the airways of the Internet to my congregation who is who have been uh, put up in their homes due to this nasty weather that we're facing. Father, would you keep us safe? Uh, God, would you allow us to be able to stay warm and to stay safe during these days? Uh, ahead of us and father keep us safe for the days to come it's they're predicting much snow and ice but father god right now would you meet with our our people your people lord in a special way father would you make the word of god come alive to them where they are in their homes meet with us get glory to yourself do that which we cannot do and god will be careful to thank you and praise you for we ask it all in jesus name and for his sake we pray Amen and amen. The word sacred, it means to be holy. It means to uh, proceed from God. It means that it's been given a, a high rating of reverence. And so it is very important for us to understand this, that the gospel is sacred. The word of God is sacred. It is not to be tampered with. When we consider uh, the sacredness of the gospel, take this jacket off. When we consider the sacredness of the gospel, we, we must go back to the Old Testament uh, and the Levitical system when the temple was up and going that two of the priests altered the order in which God said do it and they offered strange fire as a means of worship as a means of uh, doing God's work and God killed them dead because they didn't do it God's way. And next week we will see that the gospel is single and that there is but one gospel. And Paul says, if any man preach any other gospel than what we've preached unto you, let him be accursed, a thema, let him be damned. And so let him be condemned. Let him be uh, 
be thrown into hell, basically, is what he's saying. So it's very serious to tamper with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one. There's not another gospel. There's only one gospel because the gospel in and of itself is God. So a departure from the gospel is actually a departure from the Lord God of heaven, the one true and living God. And so when we think about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel brings us face to face with God and God himself. Because God is the author and the originator. He is the creator and consummator of the gospel. It began with God. It consists of God. And it will come to fruition through God and for God. Listen, the gospel is not about man. Man and his narcissistic ways has made the gospel about us. And though we were the, the reach or the the reason why we needed the gospel, but well, the gospel was not just so that we could get out of hell, but it was the gospel in which God chose to reveal himself to humanity that man would want God for who he is, not what he could do for man. But now in our modern day, the gospel has been a means where it's all about man and little about God. And that is not what the gospel was intended to do. That is what we're about to see this very moment, uh, this moment and this morning as we do our study in the word of God about the sacredness of the gospel. And so the gospel is the good news from heaven to humanity. And it was the way that God is going to choose for God to be able to come down to reach man and his depravity and to save man out of their sins. And so Paul opens the epistle defending his apostleship and validating the message of the gospel. And it's imperative today that we get back to the Bible, that we get back to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and it being an essential tool that God uses. May I say to you today and remind us that is God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save the lost. The gospel is not only needed for sinners, but it's needed for those of us who have already been saved because the gospel teaches us that not only has Jesus saved us, through the work of justification, but God is saving us at this present moment through the work of sanctification. He's delivering us from the power of sin. Through justification, we're delivered from the penalty of sin. And sanctification, he's delivering us from the power of sin where sin no longer has dominion over our life. And he is ultimately going to save us through glorification where we will finally one day be out of this sinful body and be in a glorified body in the presence of our Lord in glory where we will be saved from the presence of sin. And hallelujah to the Lamb for that. So let us dive right into this, this sacredness of the gospel this morning that we need to deal with. I want to say, first of all, we need to see the person of the gospel. The person of the gospel. Let me just say to you right now, the gospel is not a plan. It's not a prayer, but it's a person. Though the gospel is God's plan for humanity, if all you do is see the gospel as a, as a plan, a plan is just organization of what is going to be done. A plan does not come to fruition until a person does what the plan has planned out. And so I thank God for the person of salvation. And we, we must get beyond it being a plan because a plan don't necessarily mean it fulfilled itself. It needed somebody to do what had been planned, okay? The gospel in and of itself, though it's part of the plan, its essentialness it doesn't revolve around a plan. It revolves around a person. And the gospel is not uh, only... Uh, a person, and it, it does involve this, this matter of it being a plan, but it's not a prayer either. 
We don't pray the gospel. We don't say a prayer in order to be saved, just believing the gospel and us realizing that we cannot save ourselves and that we need a Savior and that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ and we are believing on Christ and His finished work at the cross to save us completely and entirely from our sins by grace through faith alone. It's not my faith plus my good works. It's not my faith and my church membership. It ain't my faith and me doing good deeds. It's my faith in Christ that is saving me. And as a result of that faith that I put in Christ and the Spirit of God coming inside of me and taking His abode through the work of regeneration and reconciliation, He's brought me on a good standing with God now. And now, through the ministry of the Holy Ghost of God, I now have a new life and a new Lord, glory to God, and a new law that allows me to live out what God has worked in through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And so the gospel is a person. And we see that in verse number three. And so I realize he begins verse number three about the provisions of the gospel or the gifts of the gospel. But we need to see the latter part of verse number three, the God of the gospel. All right, so here it is. Listen to verse three. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned, but he is implied. He is the reason why we have grace and peace because he has brought it in the moment we believed as we will see on in the, later on in this message and this study that we're doing. And so we see the person of the gospel. We see the Godhead of the gospel. And essentially, we see from God, our Father. So God the Father and His divine sovereignty and His omniscience, meaning He knows all things. When God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, He knew from the beginning that man would fall in that moment of temptation and he knew man would sin. All right? He already knew that. And so God didn't have to come up with a plan when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. He already knew it because the Bible in numerous places tells us that he died before the foundation of the world. That meaning, before there ever was anything, before there ever was a world to come, God's plan was that he knew that man would fall. He could have prevented it, but he didn't. Because he's going to use the work of the gospel, the redeeming power of God, to help show man just how much God loves man in spite of all our faults, flaws, and fallacies. And so God the Father, he planned redemption. Though he could have changed it and made man not sin in the garden, but he made man a free moral agent, meaning that man has the free will to do as he wants and do as he pleases, Yet man in his free will will reap the consequences of his choice. You can either believe the gospel and receive the gospel and be saved, or you can reject the gospel and refuse the gift of grace and peace and die and go to hell and spend an eternity trying to pay off the debt of your sin. But God made a plan for humanity to not be under the bond or the bondage of hell and the sentence of death 
and the dominion of Satan over your life, God has made a way out and he planned it through the cross, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only did God the Father, he planned it. God the Son purchased our redemption. How so? Well, it has always been blood that redeemed and reconciled humanity. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden in Genesis 3, what did God do in order to cover them of their nakedness and their shame of their sinfulness? What did, he killed an innocent lamb. He took a lamb. He shed that blood and he made them clothes out of that sheepskin. That blood initially appeased at the moment the wrath of God. God could have killed Adam and Eve, but instead of killing Adam and Eve, he made a covering over them. Instead of them staying under condemnation, God made a covering for them that they could continue to have fellowship with God through the shed blood of that innocent lamb. So from the old Levitical system that every year on the Day of Atonement, they would sacrifice and the priest would go to the mercy seat and apply the blood to make a mere covering of their sin. But Christ, when he came as the God-man, he purchased our redemption for the work of the cross. And when he had suffered for our sins once, he sat down at the right hand of God for whom he has sanctified forever and perfectly redeemed humanity. What a great blessing that the Son of God purchased our redemption out from under sin and out from under the dominion of Satan that we now have a new Lord, a new life, and a new law. To God be the glory. We are no longer bound by sin. We're no longer bound by Satan, but yet we are blessed by a sovereign God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And so God the Holy Spirit, He provides it. Through the moment that you and I are born again, the Spirit of God comes in through the work of regeneration. He takes out our old heart, according to Ezekiel 36, and He gives us a heart of flesh. He gives us a new life, a new heart, and now we are redeemed and on our way to heaven. And so we thank God for that. So we see the person of the gospel through the Godhead. But the gifts of the gospel is grace and peace. Grace is unmerited favor, meaning we could not do anything to save ourselves. Yet God in his mercy and his grace, his favor toward us, he had compassion upon us. That The Bible says that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's grace. When we deserve to die in our sins, when we deserve to be punished in eternity in hell, God had compassion and God sent his son. So grace, but then peace. It always comes in this order, grace, then peace. Uh, the peace, now the peace. It means tranquility of soul. I'm at peace with God. I'm no longer an enemy, but now I'm a son and I'm, as a son, I'm indebted to the Father for his work of redemption. And now as a son, I spend the rest of my days wanting to please the one who delivered me and brought me into his family. And so that is the person of the gospel. But number two, I want to deal with the power of the gospel. And that's found in verse number four. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God. Now this verse is packed with so much truth that we want to spend some time unpacking it. And so the power of the gospel is simply seen, first of all, with this phrase, who gave himself for our sins. Who gave himself for our sins. Now, this word gave, I've done cross-reference. I searched it out. And I've chosen four verses that I want to share with you about adding to who gave himself. 
John 3, 16, we can all quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God gave himself through the person of his son, the centerpiece of heaven, the diadem of heaven, the crown jewel of heaven. He gave his only begotten son Oh, beloved, this is Valentine's Day. We are God's Valentine. We were the object of his love. For God so loved us that he gave, he sacrificed, he sent. But not only that, that the son was willing to submit to the sending as Isaac did to his father on Mount Moriah. That they went up to worship and he says, Father, we have the wood, we have the, the fire, we have everything, but where is the lamb? And Abraham told his son, God himself will provide himself a sacrifice. And that's what God did. God gave of himself and out of himself his son to save us from our sins. What a God, what love, what compassion that he has for us. But Galatians 2 and 20 says this, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Here it is, who loved me and gave himself for me. What gospel truth. God gave himself for us that he might save us. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus 2.14 says this, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Our sins that we have committed. Listen, every person that's ever been born we came from the bloodline of Adam and Eve, and they didn't have children till after they sinned. Therefore, by one man, sin has entered into the world, and so death by sin, Romans 5.12 tells us. Therefore, our sin required a sacrifice. As I've mentioned earlier in the previous verses, and so can I just tell you right now, friend, that your sins... And my sins required a sacrifice. And through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross, he himself done all the necessary requirements to be our sacrifice. And if you go back, and for time's sake, I can't go and elaborate long on the Old Testament Levitical system about the Passover lamb and the scapegoat. But I want you to understand that our sins required a sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, meaning there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. So Christ had to become, come to this earth as fully God and fully man, and as a man that stayed God, he had to become the sacrifice for our sins to save us from the wrath of Almighty God. And not only... Our sins required a sacrifice, but as a sinner, we needed a substitute because we were not perfect. We didn't have any righteousness, and it's impossible for us to save ourselves. Therefore, we needed a Savior. We needed one who would substitute, be our substitute, that would take our penalty, that would take our place, that would take our punishment, and satisfy the righteous demands of the law. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ by his life, by his death, and by his resurrection. So as a result of Christ giving himself, this is the redemption of the gospel, is that he became our Passover lamb <laughs> and our scapegoat at the same time. 
The Passover lamb was the blood was shed and the body was offered as a burnt offering of that lamb. But the priest would take the quote unquote the sins from the family and place it on the scapegoat and the scapegoat was led into the wilderness to die that he couldn't make his way back. And at the same time, the blood was being put on the mercy seat to make a covering and a cleansing for sin once a year on the day of atonement. So Christ combined as our substitute, he became the scapegoat and the sacrifice all in one on the cross and he took our sins as far as the east is from the west and he buried them in the sea of God's forgetfulness and also he satisfied through propitiation of his blood, he satisfied the wrath of God that you and I could be saved and forgiven of our sins and not only that be forgiven but his righteousness would be put on our account. Second Corinthians 5 21 for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the next phrase that we see here is not only who gave himself for our sins. Say, well, I'm not no sinner. Well, you deceive yourself. We're all sinners and we need a savior. And so Christ gave himself for our sins. The second thing not only who gave himself for our sin, that is the redemption of the gospel. But notice the next phrase, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This is the rescue of the gospel. The rescue of the gospel. And essentially, this is the rescue, that he might deliver us from this present evil world world all right that he might deliver us from this present evil world the word deliver it simply means to rescue rescue all right so we needed rescuing the question is raised what and why did we need rescuing well he tells us from this present evil world. <laughs> so, the world in which we live is under the judgment of God. And this world will not be saved. But it's going to be destroyed because of the curse of sin. This brings up a, a great point of interest then. If this world is condemned and under sin and headed for destruction and damnation, then it is relevant to ask the question or the point of interest is, why is it? Because when man sinned in the garden, the consequences of that sin is that the earth received the curse as well. And Romans chapter number 8 tells us that this world is waiting for its redemption as well. It's ready for the curse to be lifted because when we know that God is going to destroy this world that we're living in and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and the end of times and he's going to set his millennial reign upon this new earth. And so it's imperative to understand this. This world needs saving. But the world in and of itself is going to be destroyed in order that God could create a new one. So you and I need to understand this morning that not only is this world under a curse, but man in and of himself is under the curse of sin. And so here it is. When... Adam and Eve yielded to Satan in the garden, to that temptation. They at that moment became enslaved to both sin and Satan. All right. Prior to man's sin, man had been given dominion over the earth. All right. And so when man had been given dominion over that earth, when he sinned, 
he forfeited it over to their master to whom they yielded, which is Satan. Therefore, according to John 8, 44, when you and I were born into this world, we were born under the curse of sin and we were under the control of Satan. John 8, 44, Jesus told those Jews, ye are of your father, the devil. So we needed rescuing from the lineage we were under. We were under the the curse of sin. Satan is the father of sin. He was banished from heaven because of sin. He chose to sin and he done so and he was so deceiving, a third of the angels fell with him. So when he come to the earth, the next thing he wanted to do was to corrupt the perfect creation that God had created and he tempted man and caused man to sin in the garden. And therefore, from that day forward, because Adam and Eve yielded to that temptation, we become enslaved to sin and Satan. And Satan is not only our father, but he's our master. You have to have at least one master. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. Therefore, we must have one master. You are either a servant to Satan or you're a servant of God. Not only are we, a, and so we needed rescuing to be not a slave to Satan and sin, but become a son of God. And as a son, we are a servant as well that we spend out our days wanting to please the Father. This is redemption, friend. You, you can't be saved and not serve God. You cannot be saved without being a son of God and you can't be a son of God without being a servant of God, okay? You've got to have one master. You've got to be under the lordship of Christ or you're under the control of skies of old Satan. God has now allowed Satan to have control of the affairs of the unregenerative, unregenerate world, the unsaved world. That's why our world is such chaos right now because Satan is controlling the lives of people and this is what we needed rescuing for. As lost sinners, our estate is lost. It's been foreclosed on. It's been seized by Satan and we're separated from God. And as lost sinners, the devil is our father and master. And as being our master, we are dead in trespassing sins and we need to be quickened by the Spirit of God. We need to be made alive unto God through the work of regeneration. And that happens the moment one believes, as we'll see here in just a moment. But we are dead in sin. And we are bound and blinded by Satan. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says the God of this world, referring to Satan, has blinded the eyes and minds of of them who do not believe. That is why the gospel is important. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the redemptive power of God to break the curse of sin and the, the control of Satan over individuals' lives as we speak. The gospel is the central focal point of the church. It's not entertainment. It's it's exposition of the scriptures. It ain't about feeling. It's about faith. It's not about us doing. It's about us believing the gospel because in and of itself, the gospel is God himself and God has broken the curse of sin and the control of Satan through the cross of Christ. To God be the glory. And so, the rescue. Now, let me give this simple illustration before I give some scripture to sustain what I'm about to illustrate. When we speak of being delivered, being rescued, I'm going to give two illustrations. The first one is this. Somewhere along the way, man has come up with the idea that we are altogether helpless. That all we need is just a little help to save ourselves. And so preachers have used this illustration of throwing out a lifeline, throwing out a life preserver, throwing out this 
flotation device to somebody who's drowning and that person then is able to take hold of that lifeline and put themselves in it and somehow then another, they pull them into safety. What the problem with that is, man is totally depraved. Number one, he's blind. Number two, he's dead. So if we throw a life preserver out there, number one, a dead man can't do anything. And number two, a blind man can't see to put himself in it. <laughs> so there goes that idea. That's squashed. And see, man is the creator of a false religion thinking, oh, I just needed Jesus to do that. And now I've got to do all this other. No, it's completely salvation is a work totally and completely of the Lord and the Lord of alone. And so you and I have to come to the realization that's not how salvation works. We don't throw out a lifeline and whoever's able to get a hold of it can be saved. No, we were both blind and we're both dead according to the scriptures. Here's the idea. Jesus is our lifeguard. And so he comes to those who are drowning in the sea of sin under the, under the control of Satan. And our lifeguard walks on the stormy sea that we're drowning in. And he comes down. He picks us up. And he says, live. And the dead man lives. And we believe what he's told us. And we abandon ourselves completely at the mercy of God. And we realize we need saving. And we cry out for help. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a correct presentation of what the gospel means to be rescued. Is that Jesus comes as the lifeguard to the drowning, dead, blind, and bound sinner, drowning in sin, headed for perdition, headed for destruction, and Jesus himself comes and rescues you. That is the correct meaning of this. And the next thing is he's delivered us. Not only did he rescue us from that, but he rescues us from the prison, the prison that we're in. When Christ died on the cross and he cried out, Teleasti, it is finished. And the veil rent from top to bottom, meaning paid in full. The shackles that we have that had us bound by sin, Jesus has released their power over you. And Jesus when he saved you and I, if you've been saved, born again, Jesus came to where you were in that prison. He unlocked the shackles, took the shackles off of you, and he didn't say stay where you are. He says come with me, and he leads you out of the prison. It's impossible for somebody to say that they're saved and they stay in the prison they were in when Jesus came to you. It's impossible. And if you are still living in the same old prison and still being shackled by the same old problems you were before you said a prayer or you said, I went through the plan of salvation and you're still the same old you, according to the Word of God, you are not saved. Period. Jesus came and brought us up and brought us out. That is the rescue. He has brought us out of this evil world. He has, we're not of this world, but we live in this world. He done exactly what he did in Exodus 12 when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were in the world, but they were not of the world. And that is what God is delivering us from. But yet, as we're going to see next week, Lord willing, when we get in about those who would pervert the gospel, we don't preach a social gospel. Or a political gospel. Satan is in the control of the affairs of this world. And Paul tells us a good soldier will endure hardness as a good soldier. And no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Forget it. Quit trying to make the gospel political. It's not going to happen. Quit trying to make the gospel a social gospel. It ain't about getting a crowd. It's about getting people to see their genuine need for a Savior and them abandoning themselves at the mercy of God and being delivered themselves. And so we need to get back to the gospel being a spiritual emphasis, not a social and a political and so we see this found in Colossians chapter number 1. 
I, I'm going to read a few verses. But I, I, listen, First Corinth, uh, for, uh, Colossians chapter one, verse thirteen: Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? <laughs> And translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. See, this is him getting us out from under the devil being our father and the devil being our master. The moment you are saved, we were delivered from the power of darkness. We were no longer blind, bound, and barren. But now we've been delivered and we've been translated. We've been transferred. We've been adopted. We've been birthed into a new kingdom under the kingdom of God and light. And we have a new father and a new master who's the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 14 it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let us look in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And you being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them all. So here is God redeeming us and doing the work. This is the word of God, what he's done for us. In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm just, I don't have time to uh, exegete all this. I'm just reading you this truth. There's power in just the Word of God in and of itself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. And he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things, and by him by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he that sanctifieth and he who are sancti and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the chi and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, listen to this, through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, and that is the devil. And delivered them who through fear of death whoo, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Christ has accomplished this. He's broken the power of Satan. He's broken that control. And we've been made a royal priesthood. We are peculiar people, zealous of good works because God has broken that bondage, brought us out of that prison. He got us out of the penalty of sin and out of the power of sin. And now He has justified us. He is sanctifying us. He's doing a great work in us that one day, glory to God, when He comes back and takes us home to be with Him, He is going to glorify us. And the rain of the gospel is simply this is according to the will of God our Father. This is the rain. It's God's will. I mean, 2 Peter 3 9 says, God's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you read what we want to read, some verses here. In Ephesians chapter number 1 this morning. Ephesians chapter number 1. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame. Before him in love. Having predestinated us. Unto the adoption of children. By Jesus Christ to himself. According to his good pleasure. Of his will. Alright. To the praise of His glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, 
wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This is according to the will of God. All right? And so what do we do about that? I don't have a trouble with the doctrine of predestination because it's based on foreknowledge whom God did foreknow, whom he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his dear son. So if it's God's will to make us like Jesus, it's God's will that we be saved. All right? He didn't select some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. God, according to foreknowledge, he knows what's in man. He has predetermined by man's response to himself because John chapter 2 verse 25 tells us he knew what was in man and what they were going to do and the Bible says he did not commit himself into man because he knew what was in man. He He's not, God don't want anybody to die and go to hell but he knows folks are because they refuse to believe and receive him. And that's what he's fixing to tell us here in verse Number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Listen to this, who first trusted in Christ. So he predestinated us that we would trust in Christ. And verse 13 says, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom I also after you believed, so you trusted, you predestinated, you trusted, you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. That's the reign. It's the reign of the gospel is according to His will. The rescue is the gospel is that He would deliver us from this present evil world. And the redemption of the gospel is He gave Himself for our sins. So that is, we've seen the person of the gospel we have now seen the power of the gospel. And lastly, I'm just going to mention this in verse number 5. We see the praise of the gospel. And who gets the glory over all this? Who gets the praise? It's surely in us because we've seen we couldn't do anything to help. Verse 5 of Galatians 1 says, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's God the Father. God gets the glory. It's because of God's mercy. It's because of God's grace. It's because of God's loving kindness toward us that He gave His Son for us that we could be delivered from this present evil world. Now, my question to you is, have you been delivered from this present evil world? Right now, all across the world, people are in turmoil. People, hearts are failing them because of fear. Because they haven't been delivered. And this morning, it's imperative that you and I come to grips with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We examine what we have with what the Bible says we should have if we've been delivered. My dear friend, God, through the work of the cross, has defeated Satan. He's defeated sin. He has come up with a cure for the curse that we're under, and it's the cross. The cross is the bridge over troubled waters. It is the cross and all that Jesus done that brings many sons to glory. Have you been born again? May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.